especially at the college, I think the way men are socialized, it's a a lot harder to be bisexual. Um, So the more bisexual people there are, the better everything configures, right? Um, And uh, there is the more, and just the more fluid it's, um, it's even for otherwise straight, like, I, in general, exist in society as a straight man, but not in an orgy. I'm all, I'm all, all game for all things. Uh. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 195. We're Finn and Emma, and today, first of all... It's Monday! Monday! It's a Monday episode, which you can all tell because it's being released on a Monday, but we're super, super excited to get this... Thanks, Captain Obvious. (laughs) We're super excited to get this out here. So the title of today's episode is Rethinking Orgies, Creating More Inclusive, Diverse, and Safer Spaces to Explore Sexuality. So we actually have a roundtable discussion for you with three amazing people, Leanne, G, and Zach. And they were all on previous episodes. So just to throw those out there as well, Leanne was on episode 173, G was on episode 180, and Zach on episode 141. Yeah, so they all have a very unique niche that they fill, which is they went to some elite university. G and Zach both went to Yale and Leanne went to Oxford. And while they were at these universities, they were part of and or organized, 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 uh, orgy clubs or sex parties or the like. Yes. And they will talk a lot more about this for sure. Um, so it's a fantastic discussion. Again, as the name implies, they're, doing their best to and create diverse safe spaces to explore sexuality in a wide variety of ways and we're just really excited to be able to finally get this out there we recorded this a few months ago a few months ago and it's been a crazy summer and we're just now getting around to it so thank you uh leanne g and zach and sorry for the long wait yes a couple of things about this episode that we wanted to mention first of all uh you will hear uh peaceful bird noises in the background (laughs) Those are on our end. I could have edited them out. But we left them in. But I left them in because I thought, why not? Yeah. It's pretty peaceful. Yeah. So you're welcome for the bird noises. <laughs> uh, also, there is a trigger warning around the 35-minute mark into the interview, which would probably you add a couple of minutes here. So probably around 40 minutes. Leanne's telling a story, I believe, about somebody getting drunk at one of the parties and taking advantage of somebody else. I think it was Leanne talking about this. Um, it's a fairly short story. It's not super graphic, but we did want to make sure to at least put this out there. Um, If that's something that you think would uh, trigger you in any way, you might want to skip around the 35 to 40 minute mark. Yes. And this is also one of our most explicit episodes. So just putting that out there as well, there's There's some sexy stuff. There's some sexy stuff happening. But also some really amazing conversations about inclusivity, Uh, the real, you know, the deeper meaning behind these yeah. Uh, parties and and orgies and everything so yeah it was a fantastic conversation i even share an orgy story yep there's a hilarious blooper at the end this this one gets a little bit of everything and you'll also notice it's one of our longer episodes ever because well we were talking to three awesome people about a fun subject yeah and so we kept talking we cut it short, to be, to be <laughs> frank. <laughs> it's a huge, huge, huge thank you to Leanne, G, and Zach for sharing everything with us and for creating this episode with us. Yeah. We're really excited to get it out there. Yeah. And uh, just a couple of very short announcements. We're not going to go into all of them because, again, this is a long episode. But we wanted to say a huge thank you to the Patreon community out there. We're in well into 170 plus members. It's awesome. Everybody that joins is awesome. So if you think you're awesome, join us. And uh, if you're looking for community. Yeah. Uh, so again, thank you to everybody for that. You can find more information on Patreon on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the community tab and you'll find it there. Also, we announced last week, meet and greets are coming back. So we have both a virtual meet and greet and in-person meet and greets coming up over the next couple of months. So on our website, go check it out. 
normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click, all the information click on there. The, click on the community events tab. You'll see information for Patreon, for the in-person meet and greets, and for the virtual meet and greets, and how we're handling all of those, and the dates, and how to learn more. Yes. So I think with that, if you want, if you want to ever come on the show, if you want to be a Leanne G or Zach, you just reach out. Yeah. And tell us you want to come on the show. Tell us you want to come on the show. Let us know about your story. You can head over to our website again and click on the contact us tab. Send us a voicemail. Send us an email. We loved getting them. We respond to all of them. And we will hope to hear from you soon. And now let's go enjoy this, this amazing discussion. Welcome back, Leanne, Zach, and G to the show. We're super excited to have all of you here. And Emma, welcome. Yeah, thanks. I'm here too. <laughs> uh, so you all uh, fill a very specific niche in the world. You've all been to, uh, let's say, Ivy League level or beyond. I don't know. We'll let you guys decide what the, the ranking is between Oxford and Yale. Um, and you all are members of or organizers of clubs, sex parties, events at those universities. So we wanted to bring you all back to talk about what do these actually look like and what is maybe like the deeper meaning behind this? How do we create these environments maybe at scale or how do people take lessons from what you all have done and do this for themselves and do it in a way that's inclusive and safe and fun and yeah. just um, creates a better environment? So we're thrilled to have you all back. And just thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you so much. And I think we should just start here with some introductions in case people listening haven't listened to your episodes previously. So I'm just going to call on each one of you and uh, we'll go from there to just do a general introduction. And Zach, I'm going to have you go first. Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Um, so my introduction to the sex party world was... Um, finally working up the courage to, what well, what well, my junior year of college, I finally worked up the courage to ask my friend if I could get an invite to a naked party. And uh, he's like, well, there's no naked party coming up, but we're having an orgy tonight. Want to come by? <laughs> and, um, you know, so it was kind of a total surprise for me. And I went and it was just, just a beautiful experience such that I was inspired and hooked and just, you know, and felt, felt a calling, if you will, to use this as a model to shake, shake up people's lives for the better. And when the, that group of friends that invited me to, um, to that, that part, to party with them, uh, graduated, it, kind of fell upon me to make it a sustainable uh, thing. And so thus the, thus the Yale organization was born. Oh, since then I have lived in a lot of different places, um, particularly Paris and New Orleans, where I have been involved in a lot of sex party scenes there. And so, you know, having, having a perspective of what it's like at different ages and in different parts of the world um, definitely um, informs how I how I look back at college and and all the things I would have do I would do differently nowadays. But the world is different nowadays. So. Yeah, that's an understatement. Um, how how long ago were you? How long ago did you go to your first orgy? And then how long? Like, was the Yale Orgy Club that you founded? I suppose we're going to use the term founded. Was it an official? like university sanctioned club. And I guess, yeah. When did that happen? Yeah. Founding is a word that, you know, it's a, you could, you could use it for, you know, um, convenience sake, but um, it's, it's hard to say found. I don't know. But um, so this happened <laughs> in 2012, 2012. I, and then in, January 2012, I went to the first one. The, that group graduated in May 20, 2012. I ended up leaving college at the end of 2014. So in that year and a half, I was hosting them. And in that year and a half, it kind of got consolidated into, you know, an, a, you know, an apparatus, an, an or, you know, organized apparatus 
for putting on these events. It wasn't until after my time, I think G was involved in this, that it actually became was an official like student organ organization with money from the university. And I don't know if the, the university was privy to all the to all the details, but uh, of of the activities, <laughs> but certainly the politics. And, and so maybe that's a great. Maybe that's a great place to like hand it off to G. Yes, except I want Zach. Can you describe just briefly kind of what your relationship style is now, so people have a little context on around that, and then we're going to jump to G. Oh yeah, I'm I'm poly as fuck. Um, is I would I use the word relationship anarchist, but that has a lot of bad rap. I still like I'm very dedicated to the people in my life. Um, I, yeah, I guess I've, I very, I go over the years, I've, depending on the configuration, I've gone from very like sort of coupled polyamorous to solo polyamorous. I, uh, what you call me now, I don't know. I'm out in Nevada. None of my partners are out here. So I, so I'm living very solo poly at the moment, but fortunately I get a lot of visitors, so. G came out and visited for a little <laughs> bit. That was wonderful. I got the pugs with me. Awesome. awesome. They're my primaries. <laughs> wow. <laughs> your, your pugs. Hey. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no worries. Well, thank you, Zach, for being here again. Um, and maybe the baton gets handed both in our show and um, back at the Yale Orgy Club to, to G to take things over. Hi. Uh, I'm G. I... I'm a 25-year-old human, they, them, in currently in Merida, Mexico, but I'll be moving towards Leanne in the fall, um, which I'm excited about. And my, let's say, experience with orgies, as you heard, comes from organizing at Yale when I got roped, not roped into it. Uh, I was, I was going as a partner of, <laughs> not yet. Uh, I was going as a partner of someone and who was throwing orgies. And then I realized I might as well be in charge because I like to be involved with the parties I'm already going to. And that's how I met Zach as a kind of a grandfather of the orgy team, as you call it. And right now my, I, my relationship style, I guess would also be solo poly. I have many lovers and, um, people in my life who are, again, I'm committed to, but definitely trying to break out of the traditional, um, primary partner that aren't pugs stage. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And, and maybe just to clarify when you took over Zach alluded to the fact that the Yale Orgy Club became a, uh, a, a sanctioned organization. Did you take over a leadership role? And if so, is that accurate that it, you were able to help push it to like official status? Well, so there, that's two different questions, really. I didn't take over directly from Zach. I took over from an intermediary group. And I was able to help push official status of an organization that's purpose wasn't to throw orgies. It was more like an intellectual academic arm of the, the same group of people that threw the orgies. Like we'd get together and talk about the parties and how, how to do them better. But that the actual orgies themselves, I want to be clear, were never officially sanctioned by Yale, even though we did like go to the student health services to like, you know, get condoms and lube in large quantities. But, so it was more of orgy theory. Exactly. Than... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I can get, I can get behind that. All right. Thank you, G. And thank you for being here again. Um, and Leanne, I guess you're up taken us to the UK and to the, I guess, let's hear it. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Leanne. Um, I'm bisexual and polyamorous as fuck. Uh, <laughs> um, and I guess my my I've been non-monogamous for quite a long time. I've been non-monogamous ever since I was 17 years old when I got into my first open relationship. Um, but then, you know, I was kind of um, exploring like, a whole, you know, my sexuality and stuff um, at university. Um, and I was kind of having like quite a lot of like group sex. Like, you know, I just kind of organized stuff like through Tinder and just meeting people and stuff like that. Um, and then kind of how I got into the Oxford orgy scene was completely by accident. You know, I slept with, I slept with a woman, you know, we went to a party together and then like afterwards we slept together and like, it was, you know, while we were having our pillow talk afterwards, he was, she was like, um, so have you, have you heard of the Piers Gaveston society? And I said, you what you what because i basically thought it was a myth you know i'd heard about it you know it was in the news um a couple years back um there was some scandal to do with like our prime minister david cameron like putting his dick in a pig um and there was stuff you know pig gate i'm sure you've all heard about it so it's that society and so i thought it was a myth um i thought that it, it was just a thing that kind of posh private school boys did um and then they just kind of told other people about it for for clout but um no it was a real thing and so this 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 woman, uh, she was a lesbian, you know, she told me, you know, um, the Pierce Gaveston Society is very different from what it used to be. Um, basically, there was a massive queer takeover in 2015. And basically, um, like, the the entire ethos of the society changed from just kind of like a, an old boys club type thing to like a very queer, sex positive and inclusive space. Um, and then she was just like, you know, I've heard things about um, kind of like the the parties you've been organizing on your own. And, you know, I'd love I'd love for you to attend. And, you know, I'd love for you to come. Um, and so I got involved in that. I ended up kind of inviting about like 10 percent of the guest list because I was sleeping with a fair few people at the time. Um, and I kind of just invited them all uh, to come with me. Um, and, you know, the Piers Gavison Society holds two events a year, one in the summer, one in the winter. The winter one's much smaller. It's about 80 to 100 people. The one in the summer is closer to about 300 people. And it's absolutely not sanctioned by the university at all. Like the university has spoken out against this society many, many, many times, partly just because, you know, um, it gives the university quite a bad reputation. Like in the news, um, every year the paparazzi try and kind of like find out where the secret location is and basically just track us down. And also because, you know, like quite, there's, you know, a fair bit of illegal activity, um, just drug wise that goes on at these parties. So that was another aspect of it. But, you know, I've had loads of fun. Um, and, you know, I, 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 graduated in in 2020 but i'm still kind of um in contact with the committee and stuff and obviously you know things got paused like over covid but that's kind of been um like what's going on as for myself um so as i said i'm polyamorous um i operate kind of like a non-hierarchical um polyamory style kind of relationship um i do have one anchor partner um and we kind of intend to like you know, build a life together, but we're also open to kind of more people joining us on that endeavor. And both of us have other um, lovers who, you know, we didn't kind of prescribe this label. It was something that was agreed between the parties based on like what we actually wanted out of our connection. So I have three other lovers and so does he. And yeah, it's all, it's a, it's a great time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I also kind of talk about my adventures um, and things on um, a blog that I run called Polyphilia. So um, yeah, more about that in like the episode that I did with you guys a while back. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And, and links to all of that will are in the show notes too, like all of the, your episodes and everything like that. Yeah. And and Leanne, one of the things you wanted to clarify, and you clarified with us before I hit the record button, was you were not where where Zach and G both took on sort of leadership roles. You were not an official uh, organizer. However, um, G pointed out that with the amount of work you've done, you are an honorary uh, organizer in their eyes. So. Yeah, I thank you. Yeah, no, I'm I'm glad. Uh, like, uh, thank you for acknowledging that. I mean, I to be honest, like, I didn't want to get involved like on the committee kind of stuff because um, I didn't want my name like anywhere like near that. I guess like during that time, like I was also studying law um, when I was at Oxford, so um, that was you know I I was making applications and stuff, and I very much didn't want to get like in trouble now I'm a bit more lax about it um but you know it I was just trying to be careful at the time and to be honest I think I was in a quite nice sweet spot where like you know I was having you know all the fun and getting all the perks but didn't necessarily have any of the responsibility um so yeah it worked out pretty well for me basically yeah well, perfect well and I think you know one of the things that we were excited about having all of you here is like really like figuring out like 
helping people understand what these parties actually look like. And perhaps they look different on either side of the the pond, but <laughs> like, yeah, how, how do they get started? How do we, yeah, really the safety, inclusivity, um, all of that stuff where I think to sort of like lift the mystique, the, you know, the um, mystery behind that. And so I'm, I may be like, Zach, uh, what, what did these parties look like when you founded them at Yale or when you joined your first one? Like, what did they physically look like? Yeah. So um, when I first sort of like started doing them, it was definitely the wild west of, of college orgies. I had no idea what I was doing and ju- did like went full cavalier, yellow, didn't do research, didn't know what research one would do. Like there's so much. That, um, so the first one I did was just tell everyone like show up like everyone it was the same day as our spring fling so everyone was already out drunk and having fun anyways and it was massive like for the space it was like a couple bedroom house and there was between 50 and 70 people there and it was crazy fun and i can't believe that nothing bad happened there because it was so chaotic and so like uncontrolled and um, reckless. And after that, I was like, okay, I really need to um, be responsible if I'm going to do these things. Otherwise, something bad's going to happen and I'm going to get a lot of, or and then, you know, it's going to not only be bad for me, but bad for the entire, you know, the existence of these sort of events. So after that, I got very sort of targeted with my invitations. Um, I knew enough people that would be fun that just on off the top of my head, I could send out an email list and get maybe 20 to 30 people, which I think 25 was the sweet spot for me going forward with just hosting it myself. When I wanted to go bigger, I needed to get, get people to help me. Um, yeah. And then after that, so when you're combining it with spring fling or other events, there's no need to get it started. Everyone shows up already ready to party but um (laughs) there was a couple ways we first sort of you know just had people you know drink how do you get from just people having cocktails in my apartment to having it be an orgy there that there was a couple things i did one um whenever i would greet people always in my big furry red robe and sort of like give them the lowdown as to to like what the expectations were, what the, uh, what sort of cons- how consent talk about consent in a really like, um, I don't know. in at that point now it feels very standard, but it felt radical to talk about consent the way, you know, we talk about it now in, in, in the, in terms of sex parties. Um, but back then it definitely like thinking about consent at every step of the way was just not something anyone was ever, I was ever told to um, think about it or, and didn't really exist at least in in our sort of the culture of the university at the time. Um, So that definitely, I tried to like sort of before people even letting people into the room, sort of like put people into that mentality. Um, And then, yeah, there's a couple, the easiest, the simplest way is just get your slutty friend and be like, Hey, let's start this party. And, get in start doing things in the center of the room sometime one time i i um invited people for a uh to, to have a cunnilingus skill share um where <laughs> where people would like i love that demonstrate <laughs> their favorite techniques and people would volunteer to be the you know the model of it um and that, that's a great way to sort of like build community and get things started um there was um, a spin the bottle, but uh, like a any consent spin the bottle. So when you it lands on someone, you one you ask them, "Can I do this?" But it could be anything, anywhere from like, "Can you slap me in the face?" to "Can I go down on you?" to all these sort of things, um, games like that. Um, since you know, graduating um, and hosting them in the in the real world, so to speak, there's a lot of things that I've, I've done 
or and people around me have done at other ones I've been to from having a show, like a little burlesque performance, naked acrobatics, a fisting workshop. Um, like <laughs> teaching people skills is always a great thing to do. The, probably the best one that the most, by best, I mean most successful in getting everyone banging right away um, was a tantric massage artists came and had everybody like pair up and start, you know, doing, you know, touching each other's bodies and, and various sensual ways. And it was like, okay, if you feel comfortable, change partners and now do these other massage things. And so once, once you sort of like create an activity where everyone's already touching each other in the mood, it, it's, it, you know, it doesn't take much to go further. <laughs> it's already, it's already there. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. So. Well, I, yeah, no, I think that is a fantastic <laughs> overview. And um, I think, like you said, though, like it started the Wild West and you kind of realized quickly, like, I have to like reel it in at least a little bit to create the safety and the comfort and the security. And then, gee, it, 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 when you kind of took over or came into the picture, mm-hmm. how did it look and like what? what did you do or how did you help sculpt the the way it looked moving forward? Yeah. So by the time I arrived on the scene, there was already penned by Zach, I believe a set of rules that had to be read to all guests of the party before they entered. And these included the basic, you know, rules of consent to ask before you touched anyone, even for a hug for, to say, who um, was in charge. One of the additions around my time was that people, the, who th- the organizers themselves were wearing bracelets. So we were easily identifiable because the parties had grown a lot larger. Um, but also like saying, Hey, please don't get too inebriated or um, like, basically you need to be sober to give consent. Also, if someone says no or asks you to leave, you must leave. And, you know, just kind of, making sure people felt safe. We asked that people didn't divulge identities or take photos, you know, everyone put their phones away. So there was already protocol and there was already, um, I, there, there was already a lot of structure to the events. And so, but when I got there, it was about, I guess, honing this sense of safety and especially with the rise and visibility of, you know, the the culture of violence sexual violence on college campuses especially in the states and a few incidents just on our campus specifically while while I was an undergrad right we had to put a lot more emphasis on making sure that the spaces continued to encourage ex- exploration but also you know, we had a brown list and a black list. You know, if let's say an ex that you just didn't want to see hook up with other people or a cousin who went to the same school, you could put them on the brown list. But like we had a no questions asked black list as well for, you know, if this someone shouldn't ever be allowed at one of our parties. And then we, and so there was a lot of conflicting things like going around um, in terms of like whisper networks. And a lot of times just to be fair, we just had to not invite a lot of people if there was any contention around that one there them whatsoever so yeah yeah i imagine there's can be some it can be tricky to navigate all of that and all of those different people and dynamics yeah especially when they're your classmates (laughs) right (laughs) or your tas we had a few grad students we tried to keep it the age gaps not so big first years weren't technically allowed to go either so frocos could come and what did, like, the size, like Zach said, like, the first one he did was probably a little too big. When, by the time you came into the picture, what, like, the size of the parties and, like, where were they hosted? Were they, like, yeah, like, what did yeah. that look like? So we tried to host in a different location every party just to keep things fun. You know, the novelty is not just the sex in a room full of other people. The novelty is every single aspect about it. That's, that's what I like about orgies. You never know what's going to happen. And we threw them in basements. We threw them in... My basement. On, what? 
that first basement you went to and talked yes. about in the year. That was my basement. I, I love exactly. that. After I graduated, that people still used my basement. <laughs> it was great. It had a ball pit. I was, <laughs> was like, ball it was a good time. We also threw in like a barn. Um, we used two floors on the same building one. So we kind of had like a multi-tier. We had a whole three-story house one time. Um, basically, uh, the organizer team had to cajole their off-campus friends for use of these spaces. <laughs> that makes so sense. networking. Yes, exactly. I, I think maybe one one question, and, and I want to kick it over to Leanne too as well, um, but like when somebody walks into this, when they show up, like do they walk in and it's just like people going at it or is there like it's maybe just a cocktail hour and people are – chatting and it just would seem like your quote unquote normal party. Well, that really depends on what time you arrive because we, we didn't yeah, actually, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. We didn't actually give the address out of the location. We'd meet people on a corner nearby every half an hour from like, let's say 10 to 12. You had four pickup options um, or sorry, can't do math. 10, 10, 30, 11, 11, 30, 12, et cetera. Um, and by the time it was midnight, there's already people naked, I'm sure. But if you get there at 10, everyone's just going to mill around awkwardly for another hour or so. Right. That's interesting end. because for our parties, right, we all had to, we, we all arrived at the same time because like we were taken to the location by coach. So you had oh. to be on a coach at a certain time and then you had to, and then, you know, if, and if you missed it, you missed it. Right. And <laughs> and then the coach would like take you to like the Airbnb that was booked. Um, and the Airbnb mm. would usually be like, a, like a mansion or like a three-story house or like some kind, um, or like a farmhouse or whatever, like that had like 26 bedrooms or something ridiculous. Um, Lovely. and so, so yeah, like everyone arrived at the same time. So like for us, for our parties, um, instead of just having people be fashionably late or whatever, everyone showed up at the same time. There was like a talk at the start about consent and stuff and then everyone goes in and like everyone just kind of you know talks and drinks and chats and dances and stuff and then kind of bit by bit like people start going off in pairs or threes or fours or sixes or like whatever um you know they start kind of leading each other like upstairs to the bedrooms and stuff like that and so it kind of um it the party starts in different ways like each time i've been so so far i've been to three of these parties and um every single time it's different so the first time that I went, um, my my partner um, was actually uh, the one who started the party. So he, because <laughs> he was so nervous that he wouldn't get anyone. Uh, he was so nervous he'd be going to the, and then he'd be like the one person who like didn't get any action that he, I think he massively overcompensated. Started talking to the first hot girl that he met there. And then like, I don't know, within the first hour, like they were having sex. And then everyone else just kind of joined in like after they did that. So like, so that was kind of how the, the first one. Uh, and then after that, um, I think the second one, you know, I think he just kind of got into the swing of things because like <laughs> my partner, um, he massively catastrophizes like whenever he's at these events where he's like, oh no, what if I'm the one who gets left out? Like I absolutely need to get in on this before like, before everyone, everyone else does it and then they leave me behind. Um, but he, every time consistently, he has always been like one of the first five people to get the party started. So it's hilarious. Like the second time, like, you know, he was, uh, he, he came to the party with me and then uh, a, another girl he was seeing, uh, another two girls he was seeing and then he was sleeping with one of the girls um and then uh we were in like the sex tent and he made her squirt like all over the place like everywhere and so obviously that was a spectacle um and i think a lot of the men there didn't know how to make women squirt so then when they saw him do that they just looked at him they were just like holy shit dude what <laughs> and um and then just everyone's just like damn like i need to get in on this yeah so and then like the third party was like another friend of mine a bex and bex just kind of uh, decided to uh rope in a couple guys to give give them like a like a public whipping um with some with a chain flogger that they owned um so then that kind of also really set the mood so yeah it kind of really depends but like for me you know there's like a period of mingling and then kind of about like an hour or two in like people like start kind of you know getting touchy feelings and going upstairs to make out and stuff and um yeah you know it could be like you could just be like chatting one moment and then just kind of witnessing like someone getting spanked with an inch of their life like in the next moment so yeah it's all all kinds of all kinds of wild things like <laughs> have happened um and yeah it's been yeah it, it was it was so fun like i really miss it 
<laughs> well, and I think that's a great, uh, Zach, I hope you're taking notes on one of your new workshops you can throw is the uh, intro to squirting workshop. Yeah. <laughs> good I, way, think, good I think Zach will be just fine at that. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Actually, in New Orleans, one of the demonstrations we had was a woman that could squirt, make herself squirt so much she would put out candles as like a burlesque act. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh my god. All right. Oh boy. <laughs> That's amazing. Um I, so oh go ahead. I'm I miss sorry. these parties too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just, I wanted to say one thing, sorry, Emma, that like, Leanne, you said you've been to three of the like larger, I guess the Pierce Gaveston parties, but you have also in your own right hosted a large number of your own gatherings. So like your, your experience isn't limited to that. And I think I just wanted to make that clear too, to people that like you have done a lot of the um, like vetting and creating safe spaces and done a lot of that work as well on your own to like how to make these spaces inclusive and safe and the consent piece is super important as well. Yeah, no. Um, so the, the largest kind of orgy that I have personally organized had about 15 people. Um, and you know, I, and you know, like below that, like, I don't really know at what point you would start considering an orgy. I don't think a threesome is an orgy. I would say like maybe six people would be considered an orgy six and up. Um, and I, <laughs> Uh, so I've organized like quite a few of those and yeah, like I, I, it's kind of easier to do it like on a smaller scale, you know, cause like most of the time it's just me and like a bunch of friends who I've known for ages or a bunch of Tinder matches who like, you know, I feel are pretty solid people. And then we just kind of get together because, you know, I would meet people on Tinder, I'd meet another person on Tinder and I'd be like, you know what, you know, you're super cool. Would you like to meet some of the other people I'm banging? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, obviously. Um, and then we just kind of um, do that, you know, they'd hook up, see how they get on. And then the next suggestion would be to meet up as a group. So um, that was just kind of like how, how I operated at the time. Um, but like, you know, all the orgies that I personally organized were like people that I personally knew, people that I'd personally slept with, or like people that um, they like had slept with um so it was all like a very um a much more like intimate affair like compared to the uh, kind of Pierce Gaveston parties where um it was just kind of friends of friends of friends of friends which uh, we also had a blacklist so similar to what G said um you know like if you had like a creepy ex or like if you knew someone who had just done some dodgy shit like you know like they they were immediately put on the blacklist and they'd never get invited to any of these parties so like there were kind of precautions set um that way as well and you know um we'd all kind of have conversations about like consent every Everyone had to sign like a contract not really a contract but you know we had to like read a document uh, about consent and then kind of sign our names and agree to it to kind of formalize it in a way um, and everyone had to go through that like it was like a mandatory process of like going going to these parties and I guess like in addition to that it's just kind of about like keeping your eyes and ears open um, like during during the event itself and kind of um, making sure that everyone is you know not too inebriated that they can't consent or like you know that no one's kind of pressuring anyone to do anything they don't want to do and uh, one that i really like is kind of instilling like a universal safe word at these events so um at one of the events that i was at the i can't remember why but the safe word was orchid like the flower um <laughs> and you know that was just kind of like understood by everyone like if someone said orchid like stop immediately like whatever you were doing no questions asked and you know i like and I'm sure that was like useful to like a lot of people who were like perhaps doing more kinky play and or I mean I guess like any other kind of sex as well you know it's not just restricted to kink but I think that was mostly the context in which it was used and apart from just kind of all the like the sex that was happening and this is at the like the Piers Gav stuff um like they had some like bondage experts come in um they had someone who kind of specialized in making sex furniture and he was like showing off his collection um there was like a big there was like a, a someone brought in like a sibian do you know what a sibian is oh yeah. my gosh yes yeah <laughs> i may have a great sibian story but that's for another time oh uh, yeah uh, you know like so so they like you know there, there was that kind of that was brought in um and there was like a big uh wooden x that you could like chain people to or handcuff oh. people to <laughs> um and you know just like just all kinds of things like that um that that you could just kind of play around with um at, at the event yeah as like as for my kind of own parties like you know i didn't have the kind of the budget or finances or anything like that i was just kind of like yeah you know come to my house uh bring some booze 
you know, have a good time. <laughs> um, you know, beyond that, like it wasn't that deep. But like, yeah, at the bigger parties where like, you know, they were ticketed events and everyone kind of contributed a little bit to the budget, like they could splash out on like things like a DJ or like a, you know, these like experts coming in or um, or like the venue and the drinks and etc. So yeah, you know, all around a good time. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. that's awesome. I'm sorry I cut you off, Emma. It's okay. <laughs> I've been trying to get a word in I here know, and you keep cutting me off. Uh I have either or have any of you ever had to kick someone out of a party or pull someone aside and try to handle that situation if you realize there's an unsafe or a, like uncomfortable situation? Yes. Um, yeah, I remember there was, uh, so I was with a group of friends, um, and basically, um, like some of them got quite high, like they took some kind of pill. I don't know what it was. And like one of, one of my friends was like quite out of it. And basically, um, there had been a guy who was like hitting on her, um, like for, you know, even before, like she kind of became a bit woozy. Um, and then I think like, he just kind of spotted that she like was in like her words were like increasingly like getting like slurred and that like she wasn't, uh, responding, um, or reacting as quickly to kind of conversation. And then instead of, you know, reporting it to someone, he kind of zeroed in on that and started feeling her up. And then, uh, like the, you know, it took a while for us to recognize what was going on because I think we were just involved in our own conversation. But then like, once we kind of saw what was happening, you know, he was just kind of like being like really creepy with her, um, that like we immediately like, like, like two, two of my friends, like literally just pulled him off her and then like dragged him, um, to like the organizers of the party, like for them to handle him. So, you know, like that's the only incident that I've kind of like run into, um, I've just realized you may have to put a trigger warning on this. um, So like maybe edit that in after. So that was like the only instance that I kind of like remember like people having to take like action on like on that front. But um, otherwise, you know, people have been good about it. Another time, I guess, you know, when I was at one of these parties, um, there was uh, so like, you know, me and my partner were just standing around. um, And then suddenly like I heard like a slap um and like my my partner he he was like ah what was that and he turned around and there was a guy who had just whipped him like without without his consent um he just he had like a flogger with him and he just kind of like just just whacked him on the ass um and my partner was like dude what the fuck and the guy was like oh sorry you know couldn't resist and like my partner has a really nice ass but that was not okay um and so like i kind of I went to the organizers about it, but like we couldn't track the guy down, which was really annoying because like there were quite a lot of people with floggers in the room. So like we couldn't kind of distinguish who it was. So like those are like two incidents that come to mind. The first one is definitely more scary than the second one. The second instance, like my partner just didn't want to make it make like a huge deal out of it. But, uh, you know, like stuff like that does happen at these events, you know, and I think we need to acknowledge that, that like uh, sometimes like people let some bad apples in or people just don't know how to act in these situations. And so you have to be really vigilant and, you know, just, it's not just about like having like a good time and just like fulfilling your hedonistic fantasies, but also keeping aware of like the people around you. And so, you know, like, I'm not gonna kind of sugarcoat all this and say that like it was all just like sunshine and rainbows and like people just like fulfilling their like deepest desires and things like that, because like some like shit happens, you know? And, um, you know, my, my experience is like, has mostly been very positive but for these these two instances and i think you know i think it's important to kind of raise awareness that like um stuff like this does happen yeah Yeah. no thank you zach or g do you have anything to add yeah um one thing that it bears mentioning and it's easy to forget about um, on retro on retroflection but um i the tremendous amount of emotional like sort of like energy that goes into hosting events like i probably spent two weeks where that prior to an event just um anxious about safety or anxious about you know whatever reasons and it just it was kind of i think the reason why i sort of took a step back off of them um in the pre in like 2019 was just i the emotional labor of them was just so intense for me because safety is such a huge concern for me. And, uh, and I really, you know, and the, the fact that I feel so responsible for everyone involved, what, what it was a lot. Um, there's a couple incidences. Um, one was just a friend of mine showed up way too drunk and I should have just asked him to not come in. But I think he, yeah, he was making people uncomfortable 
just, you know, ogling them and masturbating and being really drunk. I had to ask him to leave. Um, another one was a guy I didn't know. He and I were having a threesome with my partner at the time. And I, we were like in this weird situation where we were physically trying to, bo- he was trying to physically box me out of, of it. And, and I was, I was like, is it, my, my first instinct was that it was playful and like playing along. And then all of a sudden we're in a wrestling match and, 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 um, I, I was having a great time. I'm a wrestler. Um, and, but, and I, you know, but then I, then it was like, Oh wait, this isn't, this isn't good vibes. He's actually being aggressive and trying to like push me away from sexually engaging with my own partner. And, and then, yeah. And then I just like, and then, I had another friend see what's going on and then jump on his back for full attack. And it's like, okay, de-escalate. Person, you should leave. Mm. Um, That's insane. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I actually never thought I would throw someone in a headlock at an orgy for not sexual reasons, but here we are. Um, That uh, needs to be the tagline of this episode. Never thought I'd put someone in a headlock at an orgy, but here we are. For non-sexual reasons, that's the important part. Yeah, but beyond that, it was usually um, the next day somebody was like, hey, somebody made me feel uncomfortable by doing this, or this thing happened that wasn't okay. And then I would often tie, it was usually being that I felt, one, I felt responsible, and two, they were usually friends of mine. I would pretty much always follow up with them, like, hey, I know you're a good person. We're all learning how to be good people. This happened. Mm-hmm. You made someone feel this way. Let's um, let's use this as an opportunity to grow. And mm-hmm. uh, and so I had a lot of those conversations in like the weeks that followed these events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I think I want to start a conversation about, you know, because just to kind of bring the mood up a bit, um, I would love it if, um, you know, kind of if we could share some funny stories that have happened at Orgy, because like this, because like the the, the one you just shared about like the wrestling, obviously, you know, it's awful. Like the guy got really aggressive with you, but that's also fucking hilarious. Um, And I'd love it if like the three of us could kind of share like stories of just like funny stuff that's happened at these Orgies, because I think Mm -hmm. like, I don't know, I talked about this on my episode, but um, Orgies can be a strangely wholesome atmosphere, like considering like what goes on at them. And so, yeah, like, you know, I kind of want to open that to the floor. Like maybe G, like you could talk about kind of anything, anything that comes to mind. I completely agree. I think too, like in, in G, if you had anything too on like the, like not, not to be a downer, but like if there, if there was something that came to mind and then maybe kind of like parlaying it into, yeah, Leanne's question. Cause I think it's a great one. Yeah. Let's see. I, I'm trying to make sure I'm not repeating myself from anything I said in my episode too, just for redundancy, but it's okay if you do. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it twice. Um, well, I do to address the more serious component. Um, I was pretty lucky in my time as when I was present as an organizer to not have to deal with um, any overtly, you know, uh, harmful behavior, particularly like toxic or anything that needed to be addressed. But it did happen occasionally, and. I will validate Zach your anxiety because I totally got that before, during events, and even after. Yeah, with the fallout of let's say if anyone just didn't have a great time, and towards the end, I really stopped participating as much because they, when they were so large, I wanted to make sure that everyone was having a good time, and so I would just kind of roam around, like you know, a kiss here or there, um, but. It, it was much easier to monitor, not as a participant. Um, I will say, hmm, let's see, Leanne, do you have a story at the already on the tip of your tongue to to share? That's that would be funny because I was still, I think, mired in the more serious conversation. So if you want to give me a sec to brainstorm and share yours. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've got a few, I've got a few, which is kind of why I brought it up, but, but I, I don't want to just kind of jump yes, in. Yes, please. The exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, please give, give, throw, give us what you got. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So like in terms of just kind of, um, do you inject some levity into this conversation, you know, like, like obviously lots of like good things have happened. Um, and not just kind of in terms of like pleasure, but also just 
like objectively funny things uh, have happened um like when i was at these sex parties so like there's two stories that come to mind um so i'm going to tell both of them so the first one wait okay so before before i tell the story like how how explicit am i allowed to be all the all the all, all yeah. of the things yeah go for it this okay. episode is we, we mark everything as explicit it's all good okay fantastic <laughs> Okay, so basically, the, so the first the first story, um, this was um, in I think uh, 2019. It was like in like early 2019, um, and you know I was on I was on a bed with I think about like three or four other people. Actually, no, I think it was more than that. It was like several other people, right? We were all kind of like in a pile, um, but like the involved in that pile um, was kind of me and like a, a friend of mine, um, and then we were both on top of two guys we were both like having sex with two guys and the two guys were like lying on their backs and we were both like you know in the like i guess cowgirl position so you know you've got you've got that image in your head now cool um and so um the other guy that's so so you know i was like having sex with my partner and she was having sex with some guy that we'd met i can't remember his name was tim or tom um one of those (laughs) and basically uh tim slash tom um was also into guys and like we didn't we didn't know this um obviously like there are tons of like the, the queer community um like represents like a huge chunk of these parties but anyway like my own partner is straight and but then my partner does dress in quite like a like a he does look quite feminine he looks quite twinky so then like he gets guys like hitting on him like all the time at these parties and so this is one of the times where this happened um where you know like me and this girl are like riding the two of them and the and tim slash tom like turns to my partner and starts trying to make out with him and my partner was immediately like whoa and like he kind of like pulled back a little bit and the guy was like wait what and my partner said no no dude um i like I'm, I'm straight and the guy was like oh wait but you're wearing a leather harness and my partner was like yeah but that doesn't mean i'm i'm into guys like you know there's no no like obviously like i'm chill like i'm chill with that but like it's just not my thing sorry dude and then there was just like a really awkward silence like well like a while like me me and the girl was still like on top of them just looking at each other going like okay like where do we go from here like, what, what do you do what how do we diffuse the tension um and then like my partner decided to conclude the situation by like just looking at the guy and just going like uh yeah no i can't i can't kiss you bro but we can we can hug it out bro uh- <laughs> 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 and they just kind of did like a one-armed hug like while like the two like while me and like the girl were like still on top of them and it was like the most like ridiculous situation um so that was like that was one <laughs> and then the other one um was uh so this was the first party that i went to so this was in 2018 uh was it 20 20- yeah it was 20 20- 2018 and i was um at uh, I, like i went you know with like a bunch of uh, people that i was with at the time you know a bunch of my lovers etc um one of them uh, a friend of mine let's call him I, I don't think he want me to share his real name so let's call him jonah right okay my friend jonah and he, jonah's straight or at least he claims to be but like i've been saying for years and years and years that he's a closeted bisexual um and obviously you know obviously he can identify however he wishes but kind of based on what i know about him um that's just kind of the impression i've gotten so then we go to this party and stuff and then, you know, he goes off and disappears somewhere. And like, so I, you know, I was just having a fun time with my friends. And then at some point, like about like an hour or two later, like into the party, I like, bump into him again on the dance floor. And I was like, hey, Jonah, where have you been? Um, and he said, oh, um, I just had a threesome with two other guys. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> the, do, you know, because I, you know, I, I, up until this point, he's just like, yeah, I'm straight. I'm totally straight. And I said, wait, so what what happened? And he was just like, oh, yeah, like, you know, these two guys, like, they, like, started hitting on me and they, you know, took me into, like, a room. Um, And, you know, like, like, they kind of sucked me off and stuff. So then I sucked them off, too. And I said, hold on. But but I thought I thought you know I thought you were straight and he said, yeah but you know like I I just thought it'd be rude not to do it since they did it to me, <laughs> and so so I so you know I don't know like um he still claims he's straight after this whole event but then you know I just find it hilarious that like he sucked not one but two dicks because he <laughs> felt it would be rude not to return the favor um and I feel like if that is not the most British thing that I've ever heard. Um, you know, like just the situations you'll get yourself in, honestly. Um, so yeah, like so that's my friend. 
Uh, that's my friend Jonah and kind of his, the, his story of like how he's totally straight but ended up sucking two dicks in an orgy. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm all for kind of like welcoming kind of um, sexual experimentation and expression. You know, I do know that quite a lot of people really like let go and try things that they wouldn't normally even dream of trying in normal situations, right? But I think that was just like hilarious because like I just think about that. I just think about that now and I'm like, how, like how do you even reconcile that? Like, you know, like it would make sense if you kind of just like, sucked one dick you know because you felt it would be polite but two i feel there's something else going on i think i think the the thing that we've talked about a lot on the show is like labels are great to start a conversation but i think that's one where you're like well i'm straight but here's what that looks like for me yeah Yeah, right every once in a while i'm really polite (laughs) oh gosh yeah. yeah. <sighs> the social blowjob. I've I've definitely that's been a thing in my in my orgy universe for a while. Oh really? <laughs> I like the term spaghetti. Um, you know, it's straight until you put it in a hot pot of water with a bunch of other Yeah, it's, it's oh, like <laughs> I love that. Like spaghetti. <laughs> I love that too. It's straight into it's straight it's straight until it gets wet. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Zach or G? Yeah. Um, Zach, go for it. Um, yeah, my, um, I just, the one that sticks out most in my mind is my very first event. Probably, you know, what got me hooked, so to speak, was, um, it was winding down the end of the night and, and one of the, the guys who, I guess it was his apartment, he's like, I really have, feel like tonight won't be complete until we get to see a cum shot. And... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm spent. Anyone else got some? And, and the other people with dicks, they were all like, no, I'm, I'm out, bro. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, I still got some ammo left. And they're like, all right, great, Zach, let's do it. Like, And then like three willing people came to help me like get there. And they're like, so what What do you need? How can we best make this happen? I'm like, well, you know, I, I, it works best for with vaginal sex. Great. And so and it's like, okay, first person. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm feeling too tight. I can't do it right now. Second person's up. Okay. As a team, we all do it. And then we finally, we get, to, we get it working. And then we find someone who, who was like, Oh yeah, what? I, yeah, I hadn't even talked to that night, but volunteers to step up the, to the plate. And then there we are banging in the center of the circle of people chanting, come shot, come shot. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and then, yeah. And then with the glorious f- finale to all their applause, I, 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 I came all over this woman and, um, and it was beautiful. And <laughs> talk about pressure. Yeah. And you said that was your first one. That was my first one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, oh, yeah. That was incredible. Yeah, <laughs> the teamwork. Yeah. That is truly amazing. And that's how the, the then the night ended off with a bang. And um Literally. I, I, introdu- we, I introduced myself to the woman afterwards. Um <laughs> and <laughs> after the fact. And it was all amazing. Over there. And, and, and I was like and that's what when you said it was a wholesome thing, because um that I feel mm-hmm. like that's what was really in you know, people people like to contrast sexuality and wholesomeness when it's not wholesome is about, you know, what is, what is good and uplifting for the, you know, for yourself as a, the well being of a human. And these are such wholesome events. Like we are here to make each other feel good. We are, I mean, it is a, it is so, the glory of it is in it's the selflessness of it. Like we, we just like, what, you know, what, what is, what is your fantasy? What is your desire for the night? Let's, as a group, make sure everyone can have what they're, you know, achieve what they're looking for. And that was such an inspiring thing for me that I I, I just felt like orgies have made me a better human and a better community member and all these things. And so I feel like that's what got me hooked. It was one, the hedonism, great. But what really mm. got it was the the um, idealistic inspiration of it that really um, motivated me to host them, despite you know maybe yes. like the call to action to to host them, despite um, you know how scary it was. Mm. <laughs> I yeah. totally agree with that because you got to see people 
really vulnerable and like really open to sharing themselves. I think my, I, the story I've been thinking about hearing you two tell about moments that made you feel like warm and, and part of this larger community, even as everyone's like, you know, dicks in hand and clits under fingers. Like one time I had this weed lube, which I don't know if any of you have ever used. It's basically like, I mean, you know, it affects your mucous membrane and it's like kind of CBD and you get all tingly and relaxed. And I am a squirter also. And so basically it just means that like I could squirt forever because my nervous system is like no idea what's going on. And so basically (laughs) everyone's like taking turns, making me squirt, but, and then they, some people get like, weed lube on their hands and start using it on their own genitalia and they're like holy shit this is wild and this guy is like my dick is numb and like everyone's just like having fun with themselves for a second like with the weed lube just kind of like it's like a wholesome masturbatory session but just everyone kind of playing with sensation and it was just really cool to notice how we responded and like share our our, I guess, own bodily explorations together. And everyone's just laughing and it was just a great time. So yeah, <laughs> very wholesome. It's like, yeah, you're mass- you're all like touching yourselves, but it's wholesome even even in that context. Yeah. yeah. Kind of adding on to that kind of level of um kind of collaboration and, and stuff like that. I remembered another story which is like much much shorter. Like basically like um at the Piers Gav events that I went to, you know, like in terms of protection, obviously that was a con- concern for everyone, right? Like sexual kind of safety and sexual health. Um and so they, you know, they completely eliminated that problem by buying like a huge number of condoms and just kind of strewing them like all over the floor. So like you couldn't miss one. Like you had no excuse. Like if you were like, oh you know, can't find a condom, like there's one there. And so like I remember like we were in the sex tent um at one of these events and there was a guy who kind of yelled across the tent but he was like someone get me a condom and then someone was like here you go and chucked it across the room at him and he was like thank you <laughs> and um so that was like a whole <laughs> that was like a whole thing um and you know everyone was like yeah and so um yeah I know what you mean about like just everyone like helping each other out <laughs> helping each other have a good time um but yeah like I guess you know if I I'm sure like this was kind of a question that you wanted to ask as well you know how like obviously like the hedonism is great but like how do we keep safe and um that's kind of one of the ways yeah yeah no, that's perfect actually a question I was going to bring up so thank you for diving into that yeah and I was I was I think <sighs> we have not organized these types of parties at university no. I would say we have co-organized um smaller ones on the scale of like maybe eight to twelve people yeah somewhere in there and I I wanted maybe like there was something that kind of came up like in the difference on um, Leanne's end like where you either get on the coach or you don't um versus the what g said where like we go to the corner every every 30 minutes and pick up whoever has decided that that was the time they were going to show up and i think what we've found for the ones that we've done is that like there's sort of a everybody has to be there by like essentially kickoff like because at that point we put everybody in a circle and we basically go around the circle of like you introduce yourself, you introduce like what your dynamic is, what you're interested in, what you're not interested in. Do you have any, like anything that people need to be aware of? Like maybe I have a latex allergy or something Mm. to that effect. People describe their (laughs) latest STI results and their comfort levels around different levels of play. Yeah. And so like we, we basically share circle. Yeah. The share circle. (laughs) And so like that can take a, like if you have 10 or 12 people, like that can take a solid half hour to get through. But then by the time you're done with that, you know, basically everybody who's there, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. And um, again, these are for like a 10 to 12 person party. So I could see how that's probably not as practical if there's 30 to 50 people. Um, But that's sort of the level that we've like, so there is sort of that cutoff time of like you, you, it would sort of be in poor taste to show up after the share circle because you don't know, like you might've missed some really valuable information. Um, up front there. So that's just sort of our experience Mm -hmm. on that. And maybe depending on how long this goes, I'll share my uplifting and hilarious uh, (laughs) orgy story that, um, is quite hilarious. It's good. It's basically the, basically like a series of events that happened to me throughout a night. Well, you're teasing it. You might as well just say it. I'll just say it really quick and then we'll go on. So, so this, 
So this came up briefly in G's episode where I referenced sitting in the kitchen by myself eating Tim, Tim Tams. Tams. <laughs> so I learned about a Tam Tam because of that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're Excellent. delicious. So what? So what happened is we did the share circle, um, and the first there was there was a woman there who like described that she liked to have her neck bitten, and this is going to come up after my first faux pas, which is they after the share circle we kind of like break and everybody went down to the basement and I stopped to pee for literally like 30 seconds. By the time I got downstairs, everybody was already like on the bed, like preoccupied. And I was like, how the hell did I miss? Like I've been gone for 30 seconds. So anyway, I'm kind of like on the outskirts, like trying to figure out how to like where I fit in. Luckily for me, uh, one of the women there got really drunk and had to leave and her husband ended up leaving to go take care of her. And that freed up the woman who said she'd like to have her neck bitten. <laughs> so I spent, so, Moving in for the kill. So I spend the next, I don't know how long <laughs> trying to figure out like, how does she like her neck bitten? Because every way I tried did not work. Well, so, so you don't I was, know if it worked. It, she didn't give she you had, any. Like, yeah, there was no physical like emotion or response. So no I was, <laughs> I felt like I was just chewing on this woman with no, <laughs> no feedback. So like that didn't feel great. So then move on to like the next phase. At some point, people like paired off into another room, and there was basically five of us left. And this wound up being another situation where I had left for a second, and I came back, and there were two men and two women, and they were both like doggy style, but the women were basically facing like the headboard, like a couple inches from the headboard next to each other. So there was like the bottom line, there was no, room there was for nowhere you. for a, th a fifth person to easily enter the situation. So I basically just, I was like, well, I'm going to go upstairs and eat cookies. So I spent the remainder of the time in the kitchen by myself while everybody. To be clear, it wasn't the remainder of the time. You it came was, back. <laughs> it was a good chunk was, of was... the remainder of the time. So, yeah, be careful when you step in and out of these spaces because you never know when uh, opportunities may close up. Well, but I'd like to just point out that, <laughs> like, you didn't take the, like, the nice part of the. Uh, trying to give you some credit here you didn't take any of that personally no. like you just rolled with it and that's in these group situations you just sometimes have to do that like there you you have to try to roll with how, yeah and the, i think to sometimes the, the awkwardness of things to the like point of collaboration and community like there was never anybody being malicious about this i was i didn't have to wrestle anyone like zach it was just <laughs> like it was just like hey we're doing our thing and like by the way everybody kind of like got oriented like there was no room and that's okay. Like, and then you just kind of roll with it and it's not a, not a huge deal. So anyway, that's, that's my nice. And you came back later, story and you got more, so it's all good. <laughs> anyway. All right. So I wanted to, I know you both are not you both. All, all of you touched on briefly, like that it's more than just hedonism. Um, and I wanted to see if any of you had any more like, thoughts around like the why why do you keep coming back even though there's all of the emotional uh work and physical work with it too why do you keep coming back and doing these i think the atmosphere is just intoxicating to me because knowing that i mean you know we all go to kind of quite like high performing universities um and i think that um it's that kind of pressure that's like placed on us that leads to us kind of really letting go in these situations because um yeah like it's just you know it's not just like a fun time but it's also like a great opportunity to let off steam and you know like so so i think like that's that's like one aspect of it you know like when i've gone to kind of other sex parties and stuff that like w weren't with oxford students like the vibe has been very different and you know not like not necessarily in a bad way but you know it's just like it's not the same kind of feeling of like relief and release um that i did get at the Piers gaveston society and you, you know i think like you know, I think sexual expression is great. And I think people like really like feeling themselves and trying new things is great. I think that um, kind of, uh, yeah, just experimentation and uh, just being like, just, you know, just like exploring your bodies and other people's bodies and kind of learning more about yourself in the process and, uh, and all that um, are all really great things, you know? Um, and so, 
I guess that's just kind of why I keep coming back to these because um, I love the atmosphere. It's such a unique atmosphere that, you know, you really, really don't get anywhere else. I think that, um, you know, it's a very vulnerable space as well, um, kind of emotionally as well as physically. And I think like the kind of willingness for everyone to like literally bear all is uh, is really special and very unique. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said. I love that you see, you know that work hard play hard thing that's definitely true and I think in spaces of let's say <laughs> Zach likes to talk about the moral like hedonistic parts right like to really let yourself go and not feel stifled by shame or expectations and really just like let yourself get dirty like that's that's amazing. Really, how often do we let ourselves, especially with large groups of people, like to know that you're, you feel comfortable enough surrounded by all these people to just like dig into your maybe like, I don't know what kind of fantasies you have. You could, it's not like you're interacting with all of those fantasies, but at least in your mind, you know that you're like really pushing also what is easy. Like you said, it's not, it's not without the emotional, physical labor, like, right. If you're hooking up with three people, that's three times as much attention to bodies and pleasure that you need to be giving. But like the reward is three fold as well. You get to make all these people happy. And I mean, yeah, it's definitely an intoxicating environment. And I've never felt as surrounded by love. Um, yeah. Well, oh, that's beautiful. I I remember when like pro, like in a we in a very prophetic foreshadowing um a month prior to this, you know, my first ever, you know, play party um being interviewed for Yale has lots of secret societies, I'm sure in a similar way Oxford does. Um being interviewed for one and they're like, "What is it you want to do with your time left in college?" And um, I said, I want to shake the dust that have settled in the veins of Yale students, they, people mm. on a very on a, um, rigid, rigid track and haven't, you know, you know, and, and are there, they are, there's a very specific mindset and a specific rat race that everyone is a part of that is so stifling, um, that I wanted to, I wanted to shake it up. Um, and this goes, this is kind of the same sort of yearning that has, you know, led me to non-monogamy, led me to like gender exploration, led me into sexual, you know, um, all the sexual exploration I've done in my life. I just think I've, I've just always felt unsatisfied with the way society does things, you know, with the, the way, the way, how, you know, the way growing up being socialized male and all the, everything that the way it's been weaponized to bully each other, all the way, every, all the problematic aspects of gender, all the problematic, you know, the social script of hetero yes. interactions. Go people, off Zach. <laughs> especially in universities. Um, the, the selfish nature of, of sexuality that it is a game to get things from other people the the hyper individualistic nature of western and american culture especially um it pulled into realms that has nothing to do with individualism it is pure the, you know how feeling good and loving each other is a is the epitome of community events and so all of this sort of like satisfaction, dissatisfaction with, um, with society at large, but especially the Yale campus just sort of like made me feel this absolute call to action and to call it action for action. Um, and yeah, and that's sort of translated into this vast finding orgies as the, beautiful vehicle to combat all of that. You know, I didn't know about consent. Nobody talked about consent, quote unquote, uh, until college. Um, like that, that, you know, you, you, you learn what, if she says no and you do it anyways, it's rape, but everything else 
as a man, you're, it's your duty to go for it. Like there's, I didn't, you know, there's, and that was, you know, and then even when we started having those conversations in college, like it was so limited and so unsatisfactory because human interactions are so much more complicated. So using, using orgies as a way to teach radical consent culture was so valuable to me. Um, breaking down the individualistic selfish model of heterosexual hookups um, was so important to me. Uh, Breaking people out of this sort of, you know, fixation of their social reputation with regards to sexuality. Um, Living purely within these self-defined barriers of gender and sexual orientation also was, you know, <laughs> I'm at this point I'm rambling. Um, but you know, when, when, when it came down to the, these people, you know, the, the, who invited me to this and I found a space in which everything I was dissatisfied with can be, you know, blown up in this beautiful way. I was so inspired that when they left, I just felt, you know, I needed to do this. Um, and it was hard. It was so hard for me. I didn't know what I was doing. I had also, I, you know, early on in college, um, somebody had a, I, accused me of sexual assault in a way that was, you know, in retrospect, like totally false and unfair. Um, but that was made it so, that was another layer of emotional challenge to work through. Like, you know, how could I be the, messenger of this thing when I'm so besmirched by, um, by this totally horrible thing. Um, but through, but I, you know, I felt so compelled that the campus should have this, that I I pushed through that. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I fantasized about in the future, like having a campus, having this like well oiled machine, well lubed machine of, of, of or an organization where that can big enough to accommodate anyone who would want to go and has this sort of educational um, emphasis and this community and it's run by a committee rather than just one person. And, and I go back to campus four years later <laughs> visit and meet G and that's, they had built the organization that I had spent my time in college fantasizing about the existence of. Aww, and you got to come to that party in the three-story house. I know, it was so beautiful. <laughs> Aww. 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 <laughs> so, so maybe, like, I love that for sure. And I think that, like, kind of one of the things that we wanted to talk about is exactly this. Like, how how does this model translate? How How do we help? facilitate stuff like this at other universities. And I think some of the pieces in there that are really important that I've seen is like fostering the diversity and inclusivity, right? Because it, you, like Zach, you said, like you want to break out of the like heteronormative mold. And that's really tough to do if you've got 25 straight guys and 25 straight girls. Like, yep. that's, right. So like, <laughs> how do we, how do we create an environment that is inclusive and fosters all of these and at things. universities, but not even just at universities outside in of general, too. in general, for sure. And then like maybe some other things like, um, yeah, like curating the guest list and gender ratios. And is there, is there such a thing as a too big of a party or too small of a party? And I don't know, I, maybe G it sounds like you took the baton and, and almost built a, a framework around it. And I'd love to hear some thoughts from you. Yeah, I do want to give a shout out to my other organizing teammates, many of whom, uh, like also people not even officially an organizer, but attendees who, you know, really knew their shit in terms of um, how to event plan and also be equitable. Uh, We got a lot of crowd uh, suggestions from attendees is what I'm saying. So I, I'm not taking full responsibility here is all this caveat is to say. Um, and you understand sex is a collaborative thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just want to be very clear. It wasn't all me running this show. Um, and well, so yeah, we did have, uh, 
a questionnaire before to, to get an invite, you had to already be on a pan list, basically a, a large chain of emails that we recycled, um, to, we added new people to each time, but you know, the, the people who wanted to come to multiple parties were allowed to stay on the pan list and we would have them fill out if they had been to an orgy before, you know, if they had a guest they wanted to bring their, um, gender, their sexuality. And we definitely had to decide like in terms of space, that was a limiting factor in terms of numbers. And also, yeah, we couldn't invite like 10, um, straight men and like two femme people and see, you know, that's not going to be a good time for anyone. Um, I mean, maybe a few people, but chances are, uh, it won't work. So it was always a stress of like, Hey, just how straight those guys are in those situations. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's see what the, how the spaghetti, uh, noodles. Um, and yeah, it was always, that, that was part of the anxiety. Like, okay, who's going to show up who actually gets the invite, who's going to come and make like, you know, be good energy. Cause you want to incorporate new people each time, but you also, don't want to have a party full of noobs because then no one will get things started. Um, so I guess let's say translating this outside of what I have already known to have like existed and seeing how other groups or, you know, communities could implement similar things. I would say have a vision first, like set a number, like the space is a a limiting factor, but, um, also just like in terms of what you might feel comfortable throwing like maybe your own party for a first time. So if you have let's a couple of friends or play partners that know each other, try to meet for maybe like give yourself an hour all together in a place with like, you're not allowed to take off your clothes. Like it's always more fun if there's some buildup and you know that, uh, it was well, something's going to happen, but it's not allowed to happen yet. Right. So you're just hanging around having snacks and drinks. Cause that is a really not necessarily alcohol, but just, um, you know, hors d'oeuvres and getting to know each other, talk a little. I like the fact that you guys have this circle there of whoever's there sharing beforehand. And I think that's good, especially on a campus. A lot of the people do know each other or, It's not necessarily that you want to go and talk to everyone. You're there like with a few friends. So definitely uh, encourage like finding friends that you want to go to parties with that you might not be sexually active with. Like they're not a physical lover, but you'd be comfortable being next to each other while you both have sex with someone else. Um, I think these kind of uh, horizontal structures of support are really crucial. I don't know if that answers the question, but no, no, I think it's beautiful. Yes. Do Leanne or Zach, do you have anything else to add? I think what G said was beautiful. Um, I think uh, I, you know, I agree. I agree with that. And I think on a, on a practical level, I mentioned this in my own episode, but um, uh, I think, yeah, like gender ratios to some extent, um, like are like, Im- like important. And I've generally seen things work out better when the group is majority queer and also majority yes. women. <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> um but like majority queer because then there's just kind of more fluidity and like who can get with whom um and then more women because like i think more women just kind of contrib- like particularly queer women um just contributes to an atmosphere where like penetrative uh, heteronormative sex is not the focus um of the orgy and people can participate in kind of more sensual activities that don't necessarily involve like you know dick and vagina um and also, um, I think like the dick owners in the room, um, probably, um, will struggle less with erections, um, if they're not kind of pressured to like fill every hole in the room, so to speak, <laughs> or like or crudely. Um, so yeah, like basically just kind of, um, majority like women, femmes, like whatever, um, has in general contributed to like, a, like a much more, um, kind of wholesome space um and safer space as well so um yeah that's kind of like on a practical level like that would be my personal tip yeah awesome thanks leanne how about you zach yeah um a lot i i have 
there was there was a little bit of internal politics at conflict, like trying not to be stuck into gender stereotypes and norms, but in general, just it was better with more women. Um, I think a, not. Ju- I think there was a couple reasons why that worked. One, like the more people are, you know, especially at the college. I think the way men are socialized, it's fit, a lot harder to be bisexual. Um, so the more bisexual people there are, the better everything configures, right? Um, and, um, there is the more, fl- and just the more fluid it's, um, it's even for otherwise straight, like I in general exist in society as a straight man, but not in an orgy. I'm all, I'm all, all game for all things. Um, but, and that's, that kind of is the vibe we, you know, that works best. And so, and it's easier for women to be that way. I think, you know, there's a lot less stigma of, you know, straight women um, experimenting with other people. Um, Yeah. There's, you know, also the way we've been socialized is it's easier for women to view sexuality as a collaborative experience. That's not about, you know, getting something and, you know, getting, you know, putting a dick in a hole. Um, and so that sort of like communal atmosphere was easy. Obviously there's lots of guys that, you know, break all those models and are fantastic and I love inviting. Um, and so, and yeah, you just need, and there are women that, you know, definitely did not work, you know, or add a lot to the environment. Um, so, you know, you just, you find your cool people and you get there, but in gen, you know, as a rule of thumb, like, yeah, sixty percent women, um, and generally a guest list that is as queer as possible. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Like what? Like I think I said it. it what? But when I was interviewed, one of my favorite moments was like we were already like majority men, and I was feeling a little anxious about that. And a buddy showed up with like five straight guys. And at the door, I was like, really, dude? What the fuck? You know, <laughs> that's, that is social faux pas, but whatever, come on in. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, like, I don't know, I, I was making more punch or doing whatever host activity. And I came back, and all five of these pre- otherwise straight dudes were all making out with one another and foot around. And I was like, all right, okay, yay, college. Yay, <laughs> 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 <Yeah>, college. <laughs> That's why, that's why the, the term, the old college try, right? Yeah. That's where that comes from. <laughs> um, but, awesome. oh yeah, but, but yeah, as far as the more logistics of too big, there's always, I mean, there's always too big. Um, the most important too big to worry about is too big to keep people safe. Um, mm-hmm. Too big to know and trust and monitor. Um, See. So like you could have inf- any arbitrary number of people as long as you have the infrastructure and um volunteers like to make sure everyone is safe and the space and then you know the the second the second you know i think most important too big to worry about is the space i am a big fan of just cramming a lot of bodies in a small room and watching and watching magic happen not everyone feels (laughs) that way Um, (laughs) like a sexy mosh pit yeah Maybe because I got my start in these tiny college dorms um, <laughs> um, that I kind of am partial to that. But definitely in New Orleans, when there's a lot more space, people get really upset if there's like too many people for the space to uh, up, which is fine. We're adults now. We, we can we can give ourselves space and room. Um, <laughs> there is also there's like the idea. There's a lot of anxiety of being sexual when there's like strangers walking all around. Um, so like, I feel like if I'm going to have fun and be sexy, like, you know, probably my favorite amount is the 15 is a 10 to 20 range, just as far as just have my personal going to have a great time, but I'm also a social butterfly. So having, I agree there so I could bounce around and, you know, and flutter from room to room and see what everyone's doing is also a lot of fun, but it's just as far as is, if I'm actually going to, participate in sex it'll probably only happen in the smaller events um yeah 
I, can't, I just had a thought really quick. I, I'd love to say, I think the golden ratio is enough people that you could hook up with all of them. Like <laughs> satisfactorily. <laughs> I love that. The bigger events I find, you know, yeah, for the smaller events, I, I prefer for sex. The bigger events I prefer for kink actually, because I'm also an exhibition. Yeah. So the last major kink party that I helped that I was involved, I like was a volunteer at, um, had probably three 400 people um the kick it off event was was a where i was bound to a cross and whipped by a dominatrix um that was a lot of fun but yeah that was that was sort of like the the opening demonstration to try and get things started um so i yeah in the last couple years i've gotten really into kink and especially exploring my masochistic side um and so i'll have i'll say that when it when it comes to that kind of stuff, I do like a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I jump in there and say I do like a crowd as well. Like I think um, I, apart from just enjoying group sex, I also really enjoy the exhibitionistic aspect of it. Um, I like having people watch and, you know, and I do know actually the, the some monogamous couples do go to these sex parties where they don't have, they don't touch anyone else except each other, but they like being watched by other people and have them kind of um, spectate uh, like in that aspect. But for me, you know, I've, like I, I, I would kind of second like everything else that has been said here so far about kind of you know as it as long as you have the infrastructure for it you know that it you can't have like too big a party, um, but personally um, I have found like a happy medium uh, with like ten to fifteen people like I think that's where I feel com- most comfortable because I know everyone uh, I tend to know everyone and, and get to know them quite well, um, but then it's also not so small that like I'm kind of pressured to get with everyone else in the room if I. Yeah, particularly if, if there's someone that I'm not particularly attracted to, um, but it's also not so big that it's overwhelming. Um, so that would be kind of my take. But equally, you know, I've also really enjoyed myself uh, in kind of bigger spaces. Um, so yeah, it's not a kind of hard and fast rule. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I was going to throw a quick, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, of course. Always. I was going to say a blanket statement that like G kind of touched on, but like, you, that's not a requirement when you go to these parties that you have sex with everyone. I mm. think that was or just, anyone or anyone. Perfect. Thank yes. you. Yes. I think that's just a, a, an important point to make now, even though G's preference is that it can be everyone, um, that's but it not, doesn't have to be. Yeah. Everyone's, well, of everyone's mileage may vary. So I just, just wanna... I, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like as in like in a party, you want to be able to talk to everyone if you want to. Yep. Right. Like yep. just the, having that option. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Not yes. like a, I have to, yeah, totally. <laughs> we no, yeah. no judgment, G. We don't judge. <laughs> no, no, it's not about judgment. It's just, I'm, I'm not saying like that's what I meant. It's just like that. The capacity for that is a nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's no, great because I, I feel that way. Normal parties, my ideal size exactly. is, is enough time to talk to everyone at the party. You know, exactly. Energy, the ideal time is enough to make out with everyone at the party. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get exactly. me. Well, in the interest of time, because I know we could all keep talking for hours and hours, um, but we want to just, like, of course, thank all of you for joining us and doing this roundtable. And we wanted to let each of you go and see if you have any final thoughts that you wanted to get out there in the world. I mean, just enjoy yourselves, guys. <laughs> just, you know, um, explore your desires and try and make, find a way to, to, to make them happen as long as, you know, you're not hurting any, every, anyone and everyone consents, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I don't know if this is really on topic, but Zach had a blooper story that I, he thought I was going to tell last time that I didn't tell that is hilarious. And I think it should be known to the world. Well, but I think Zach should tell it. <laughs> okay. All right. Make it happen, Zach. Uh, okay. When she came to visit, um, definitely unsurprisingly had a lot of chemistry. Um, but, um, at w- one point we were doing a scene where G-, G was all tied up, um, and very much like sort of the, the power play of, of aspect of kink. And so I had G tied up and, you know, made them, you know, play tug of war with Lloyd. So I got a toy, you know, with the, the and, you know, with the, using only mouth play won a tug of war game against the pug and then needed, needed ice for our glasses so it was snowy outside and so had G go outside and while totally tied bound and tied and, hand, and naked yeah na- oh yeah totally of course naked um hands hand behind <laughs> the back go like gather some ice for our drinks 
Um, and yeah, it, it was a full night, you know, lots of shenanigans. And then um, the next morning. First thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah. First thing in the morning, wake up, let the dogs out. Good morning, world. Um, and I hear this voice like, hey, Zach. I don't know. What's going on? And then I, behind me, right above my door, there's a camera with a little like speaker attached. And it's my landlord who's out of town going like, hey, Zach, just want to let you know this camera's here. I can see things out of it. <laughs> and, and right directly where I had been naked, tied up, getting snow. Oh, the no. Before. <laughs> Oh my god! And, and it was just like, oh, the realization hits, and you're like, oh shit! <laughs> but apparently, the landlord kept, they kept like, it's an like older couple, and they kept being like, when is your friend coming back? <laughs> always asking, oh, that's... always asking, when are you coming back? When is she? When, when are they coming back? <laughs> That is mortifying. <laughs> yeah. Just, like, I would just evaporate so, on the spot. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you basically always want to be careful where where you are in terms of, like, visibility. Like, the neighbors. Do you want the neighbors to know what's going on? Do you, like, that's, a, I guess, the orgies at the Airbnbs are a good solution to that. Cameras. You got to be aware of cameras. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, know where the cameras are and what they're and who's looking at them. Right, <laughs> right, <of> them. <laughs> right. Which actually could be something at Airbnbs too. You never know, so yeah. like you gotta so, check it out. <laughs> yeah, we. I would say we had that at one time. We had an Airbnb with a hot tub, and there was a camera that pointed like at the door, and the hot tub was definitely within range of that camera. And so whenever we went and got in the hot tub, I'd just unplug the camera from the wall. <laughs> Like, nice, <laughs> nice. Like, not my, not my problem. I'm not going to leave that plugged in. So I just unplug all the cameras and we'd go sit in the hot tub for a little while, and then we'd get out and I'd plug it back in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Be aware. But yeah. fun, but, but to the to the point to the the final wrap up thought. Um, my, I'm just excited for because I. I mean, like I said, what motivated me to be a part of sex party scenes is just, you know, facilitating the societal shift. And it's a societal shift that is happening. Like just in the few mm. years I was in college, just the culture, the culture had shifted to where, you know, to be more um, g- trans inclusive, gender nonconforming, queer inclusive, sex positive, consent heavy, like pe- people, society is waking up these issues and and i just you know the fact leanne's like experience well it's hard to compare entirely across the pond just the you know shows to me that in the last 10 years like society has really changed in a beautiful positive way like like you said the 2015 queer takeover like that was was, (laughs) love that um and i'm so excited and to see the way young people those young people, um, well, our generation, <laughs> and us young people, are cha- have have changed the world and doing what we do. The way you know Emma and Finn are changing the world w- with their with this podcast. The way G is out in the world, and um, and I'm just very blessed to be, have been a part of it. Aww, beautiful words, beautifully yeah. said. Yeah, and thank you, Zach. And and I just I extend a further thank you to, to all three of you, like for coming on the show to begin with. You know, Zach, you put us in touch with G and a, a whole host of other people. I say characters in your life, not in a derogatory way, but they have been integral in your life in various ways, and we love that. Um, and and Leanne, yeah, thank you um, for being here as well. G, was there any final thought? I know you wanted to get the blooper of you um, <laughs> hanging out yeah. on hanging out on webcam in the Airbnb yard, I but I just thought it was a really <laughs> great story that I missed the opportunity of last time. Um, and no, I can't think of anything that Leanne and Zach haven't already eloquently put out there. Just want to reiterate how grateful I am to have gotten to grow within these communities which you guys are all you know i think included in in terms of these sex positive and welcoming and the fact that you know we're all relative strangers yet i 
feel like I can tell you this story about me being naked on a camera (laughs) and we can laugh about it. And that's, and that's going back to what Leanne said about the wholesomeness. Like that's what I love that we can all be authentically ourselves Mm -hmm. and just be supported in that joy. So thank you. Hit me up when you're in the UK, G. (laughs) I I plan on it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, I want to come. Um, <laughs> I mean, me hey, <laughs> come shot, come shot. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, hey, we're hey, I think we just, we're all sighing. I know. Did we just become organizers? I, I think we I just. Think sure I, so. think yeah. what, I think that's what just happened. I think so. <laughs> Well, <laughs> Can we just become best friends? <laughs> well, uh, a final thank you to all of you. Um, again, yeah, thank you all for being here. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and I hope we can, I don't know, assemble the Brain Trust again in the future. Um, <laughs> this has been super fun. So, yeah. Thank yes, you. thank you for getting that orgy love out there in the world. Yeah. yeah and have wonderful afternoons, evenings, mornings, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, we'll all talk soon. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a joy. And we're back. We hope you all enjoyed that amazing discussion and had so much fun listening. And learned. Uh, yeah. I mean, this was an educational. That too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much again for to Leanne, G, and Zach for coming on and sharing everything that you did. We obviously couldn't do these types of things without you all. So thank you again. Yeah. And for coming on the show originally. And for anybody listening, definitely go back and listen to their episodes. All of them are fantastic. And links are in the show notes. Yes. Links are in the show notes. This is an echo in here, isn't there? You didn't say that part. I know. You said it and then I echoed it. Okay. I was making fun of myself this time, not you. <laughs> Got confused. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> anyway. Don't worry. You're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anywho, next week, not next week, this week. On Wednesday. On Wednesday, in two days. You don't have to wait that much longer to hear us again. We have an amazing interview with Jarrett, who is Jamie's partner. Jamie was on episode 184. You don't need to go listen to the episode 184 before this one, but it may help. I mean, you've got a whole day. Right, so go listen to what that one. What else are you going to do? Jamie's episode is incredible as well. So we're excited to get Jarrett's story out there. Stay tuned. That'll be coming out on Wednesday. And in the meantime, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the contact us page. We'd love to hear from you. The podcast tab has all the show notes and links and photos of our guests and everything. And then the new, somewhat new, community tab with Patreon and in-person events and meet virtual events. Go check it all out. Also, just to be clear, our in-person events are not orgies. Oh, no, no, that's a good, that's a good clarification. Just to clarify, I don't know. We thought, well, we're talking about orgies. Maybe I should clarify. This is not an orgy. They are meet and greets. It's actually going to be at a park. It so is. no orgies in the park. That should be the title of this episode. <laughs> I like our, I think I like our All title. All right, we'll stick with the title. Uh, we'll see everybody on Wednesday. Thank you again, uh, Leanne, G, and Zach. And thank you listeners for being here. And hanging in this long episode. Yes. And we will see you all in a couple of days. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.